John Lewis, the badass vegan. Welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Wow, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, well, so you, you haven't asked, but um, the policy is, you know, all language is fine. So uh, your your book has lots of asterisks in it and uh, lots of frank talk. So we don't we don't have to uh, expurgate anything. I've got an E next to every single one of my episodes in Apple Podcasts, so we can we can let it fly. Hey, I, I, that's good to know going in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you said you were, you were just on with the BBC. I imagine they have a different um, policy. Totally different. Totally different. <laughs> <laughs> but they also know my character, though, know, so I, they know what they're getting into if, if this goes down, if this happens. Right, so, so they'll, they'll put you on a five-second delay. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Well, I, I've been excited. I've been wanting to talk to you for years. Our, our mutual friend Josh Lajani turned me on to to you and your work and your Instagram feed, and I, I was surprised. Like I watched the promo video about you today, and it says like you're in your forties. I, I assumed you were like seventeen from <laughs> just how youthful you look. So so clearly you're I, doing I something like, right. I feel like it every now and then, and uh, my body likes to remind me like, hey, bro, we're not. We're not fucking seventeen anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> those knees, those knees are the best reminder you'll ever have <laughs> of your age. Uh huh. Right, like yeah, they, 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 they were designed by evolution as a, as an afterthought, apparently. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I want, I want to kind of you know get into your story, talk about your your new book that I I've, I've just you know read read through the galley and it was just it's so refreshing but why don't you why don't you begin by just introducing yourself to my audience for folks who don't know you uh name is john lewis uh go as the badass vegan um born in little rock arkansas raised in st louis missouri currently miami um between miami and north carolina for the most part um let's see uh wasn't raised vegan ate the standard american diet the sad diet um uh, for the majority of my life. And then my mother was diagnosed with colon cancer and uh, learning more about the disease, uh, found out that it was primarily like uh, the abundance of animal protein mixed with the fried fatty foods that led to her situation. And um, I didn't go immediately, but I did more research and more and more research I did. I just saw that um, it wasn't just cancer that was related to the uh, animal protein, but also the, you know, hypertension, heart disease, and the list kept going on and on. And I was like, well, you know what? Maybe it's time I change it up. And yeah, that was around 16 years ago now. So I uh, didn't go to start a company, didn't start go to create any kind of brand. It just came along with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I was reading that story, it, it struck me how unusual it is for a doctor to understand the root cause of chronic lifestyle disease. Like most people I know go to the doctor with a cancer diagnosis and the doctor says, well, that's your genes or it just happened or maybe there was yeah. something in your, you breathed in your environment. Um, that was pretty cool that you had a doctor who actually understood something about lifestyle. Yeah, very, very unique. The, the crazy part was I didn't understand how unique it was at the time. Um, just, I just went with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay, so this, this is what doctors know when in fact he was like maybe yeah. one in a hundred thousand. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and the, the, the funny part was it, he wasn't necessarily telling me to change my lifestyle or change the way I eat. He was just saying, Hey, this is the root cause of this. And you know, if that's how, cause I was like, this is not hereditary. He's like, no, this is not hereditary. This is. There are some hereditary factors, but if you don't feed the, you know, the hereditary factors, then it doesn't bother you. So it just it just made sense to me to try it out. And then I started seeing how much better I felt and being an athlete, how training wise I was able to, you know, run these half marathons, playing basketball tournaments. You know, I'm usually the oldest guy out there Well, with basketball. When you know when it comes to half marathons, um, that's not always the case. I I just ran a half yeah. marathon in Jamaica, uh, December fourth, and I, I 
I still, the funniest part about it was there was this lady, she had to be damn near 60, 62, 63, and I just couldn't catch her. I just, I, I couldn't catch yeah. her. She, and she knew I was right behind her. And it was like, she just kept the stride going, man. It was like, the harder I worked, it seemed like the easier she went, and she still kept just pulling away. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sure you made her day. <laughs> she gave me something to work harder for for next year. Yeah. Right. Well, what, what, one trick I discovered is after, after you reach a certain age, if you want to keep looking younger, just shave your head. <laughs> I, I'll get. I'll def, I always say, it, you know what? If I start losing it, I'm just gonna shave it all off, man. There's no need in trying to hold on to it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you know, you talk. You say, okay, you were you were an athlete. Um, you have an amazing sort of you know story arc of of your life. Like in the book, you know, you say like you were a crack baby. Yeah. Like that's that's yeah. pretty. You know, frank and brutal language to yeah. to hear it's in a health book. Tell, tell, can you talk about that? Yeah, so uh, my birth mother was uh, addicted to crack cocaine when she was pregnant with me, and my grandmother, who adopted me um, at birth, she took over. And so, like, I I never called her my grandmother because she adopted me. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the relationship we had. And my birth mother was actually raised as my sister. So that was an interesting dynamic growing up. Um, like, I didn't even meet my, my birth father until I was 21. Um, and, you know, I have aunts and I have a, I have a little sister by uh, him as well. So, like, I had a, a very interesting dynamic. But I also know it's not unique in the environment that I was brought up in because the more and more I share the story, I hear more and more people say, you know what? I had the same situation or I had a cousin that was in the same situation. And that's why I like to share so much of my story because I want to show that like, no matter where you came from, no matter what your past is, you could still change your life for the better. If you want to, like no matter what your environment is, you still control a lot of what goes on in your life. Yeah, and what I, you know, one of the things I'd gotten from from you just from following your Instagram and kind of you know getting to know you very uh, asymmetrically um, is like you talk a lot about you know the, the the responsibility and the opportunity to heal generational trauma, and part of mm -hmm. that for like for me looking at you is that there's no like you've put it all out there. You you've dealt with any sort of shame that might come from you know, how you, how you grew up and you, yeah. you know, you, you've kind of integrated it into, into like a really positive person. Yeah. I, I believe that's the only way you can get over it. Like we, we like to brush stuff under the rug or we like to like not disclose it. Or we act like, we like to not acknowledge the bad things that may have happened in our life. But if you really think about it, the only way to heal yourself is to actually look at whatever the problem is and work on the problem. I mean, you can't just brush everything under the rug. Like my my analogy with that is like the more stuff you brush under the rug, eventually it's going to form a mound and you're going to trip over that mound. Like you can only put it under so many times before <laughs> it actually comes back to get you. So that's the way I look at it is like, yeah, I might not disclose everything in my life, but I'm like, you know what? At the same time, I know that this could probably help somebody else out. And it's it's therapeutic to actually like get it off your chest as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, as you said, for people to recognize that we're like all of us are fucked up. <laughs> that every, oh. you know, that I have my story, you have your story, and that like it's the biggest secret in the world. We're all walking around trying to hide our like a common wound. We're a we're a bunch of fucked up people pretending to be perfect. That's the that's the way it really is. And and the the the, the <laughs> happiest people. The happiest people are the ones that just said, fuck this. I'm tired of pretending to be perfect. <laughs> I love that. Um, so what, one of the things that you've you've talked really eloquently about um, is and, and you have this, this movie coming out called, you know, they're trying to kill us is mm -hmm. like you're very outspoken on uh, racism, racial issues, systemic racism, racial justice. 
And that gives you, you know, there's a place in which in, in the book where you're citing statistics and you're saying basically the diet, especially specifically, you know, black men, but you know, the black community in general, our diet is more dangerous to us than the police, than yeah. the gun, than. Yeah. And I'm really, you know, interested in that because like somebody, somebody like me could hear that and say, it's like a Bill Cosby thing. Like, you know, you know, pull your pants up. Like it's, you know, like whose responsibility is it? Exactly. Um, and, 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 you know, you're, you're talking with such, with such nuance about that. Yeah. And it's, and it's not saying that, you know, police brutality is not a problem. It's not saying that gun violence is not a problem. It's just that if we're going to talk about, you know, when people bring up black lives matters, like if they really matter, let's talk about what's killing more of us than anything that's out there. Let's not push this, you know, on the back burner. Let's let's take advantage of what we know we can take control of and we can take control of what we put in our mouth and what we put into our system. You know, we just found out a new stat that um, black Americans, black men are 500 times more likely to die from a heart related disease, which is the food we eat, than police violence. And that's 500 times more. That's crazy. Mm -hmm that is not being talked about. And that's why it's like, you have to bring these subjects up in order to fix the problem again. Like you can't brush them under the rug. You got to talk about them. And then you got to take it a step further than that because it's one thing to bring up the problem, but it's another thing to actually do something about the problem. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you about that. Cause you know, I, I do a lot of health coaching and the biggest predictor in my experience of whether someone is going to do the right thing or the wrong thing when they know what the right thing is, is how much stress they're under at that moment. And we know, yeah. like, you know, the, the black community and other uh, historically marginalized communities are under an awful lot of stress, right, from yeah. systemic racism, from um, intergenerational impoverishment, like... Yeah. How, you know, if we're going to help people change their habits, how do we create a, a, a mental platform that is, you know, is sort of robust enough for them to do it? It seems it seems like a really tall order. It's a very tall order, but it's but, you know, one thing that I've had to basically put in my own mindset is that something being hard does not equate impossible. It doesn't, it's not the same thing. Like mm. a lot of times we'll hear something is hard. We're like, well, it can't be done. It's like, no, no, no. It's just going to be hard. It doesn't mean it's impossible. And it's, again, it comes down to the point of, we know that the government is fucked up. We know they've done some horrible things. We know they're still doing horrible things. And when you look at it in that sense, it's like, if it took them 400 years to basically say, hey, you know what? we may have messed up back in the day and how we treated you all. It's going to take them another 400 days to basically correct everything that they've done. But do we have 400 years to wait? So it's like, you can't expect the person that gave you trauma to also heal you. And that's where you got to come heal yourself. Mm -hmm. And it may be hard. It may be next to impossible, but it's also next to victory. And any victory you've mm -hmm. ever had, you had to put some work into it. And that's what I'm saying here is that if we put the work in and we eat the right things and we do the right things for ourselves and our family, guess what we forget? The stress level actually goes down. You could be broke. You could have a lot of things going on. But when you're your healthiest self, your stress level automatically goes down. And then now you can work on the other stress factors. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of, one of the things you point out is all the interconnectedness of all of it. So you talk about, you know, the, the pig farms in, in our, our state of North Carolina and mm -hmm. how, like, if we're talking about environmental stressors, living near a CAFO, a factory farm, is a risk factor for all sorts of, of diseases. And yeah. guess who, you know, who they build the pig farms next to and who gets to live next to them? It's it's. My, mar marginalized people who don't have the the clout or the money to leave. Yeah, 
Yeah, we but um, during the investigations uh, for filming um, and making the documentary, you know, one of the KFOs that we went to, um, basically, he had three lagoons full of hog waste, and just one lagoon had over, I want to say, two hundred thousand gallons, like crazy amount of, of hog waste. And nobody's coming to buy hog waste. So what they do is they have what they call spray fields. Now, these aren't necessarily crops. They're not growing anything. They're, they're not using manure to help it grow. They're just doing it to get rid of the hog waste because they're creating hog waste every day because these hog farms, mm-hmm. the hogs never see daylight. They're in these concentration camps, as you could say, sitting there. Their feces are running down in these wooden planks into a, a vat, into a pool. So they do that. So what happens though, when they spray this hog waste, it basically, if all it takes is one breeze and it blows into these neighboring communities. Um, you know, one of the, one of the people that we interviewed actually passed away from these, uh, effects of living that because we had, um, we had a basically test run on these certain houses around these KFOs. And we swabbed the the walls, the kitchen, the toys, the, the bedrooms, all of this, and they all came back with hog waste. So these people are living in this; they're breathing it, they're eating it. That you, anybody that knows anything about waste, human waste, animal waste, ingesting waste is going to ultimately make you sick and ultimately lead to death. And these these communities are sitting there in it all day. Yeah. So you know, and and again, like there's there's so many different levels at which the problem we can you know we can analyze the problem. You know, one one of them as you mentioned is like stop eating that food, so you stop contributing to that kind of you know systematic um, brutality and oppression. Um, another is sort of you know. What you're doing, this kind of you know camera activism of, of like changing hearts and minds through through um, you know visual media and social media. Uh, another right. is sort of you know legal or or political, um, and I guess all, all of those require you know healthy people who who have you know basically unfucked themselves to some degree because everything you're describing is like you know n- life as normal. It's it's when you look at the world, this all seems fine and normal until you've gotten some sort of, you know, I almost hate to use the word wokeness, but the word woke, like, yeah. used to be a good word. It was a good thing. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny. It's like the more, the more, and I, yeah, I don't like using that word either, but it, it's the more woke you are, it's almost like the more pissed you get. You're like, it's like the rabbit hole just keeps deeper and deeper and you're like, well, I thought I knew everything about this, but now I just learned about this that's connected to that. And it just, it just keeps going, keeps going and going and going. It's like, you might've, you might've went vegan for health reasons. You might've went vegan for animal rights. You might've went vegan for human rights. You might've went vegan for the ecosystem. And then you start to see it's all fucking connected. And you're like, well, hold on. Like I went for just this one thing. And now I see it's this big spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, t- I've talked to a number of, um, of black vegans who have been start- starting to call out like racism in the vegan movement. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, I'm, you know, <laughs> and I know we all want to be one big happy family, but it's, as you say, let's not sweep things under the rug. Like, wh- what do yeah. you wish that, like, you know, white vegans understood or were sensitive to that, that we're not? I think sometimes they, they don't understand that human rights is a part of the vegan movement. I think I think a lot of times they there are situations where not all white vegans, I don't want to say that, but a lot there's times when white vegans don't understand that as a black person the movement for black equality it, it supersedes what they look at animal rights because black people from time to time, they're like, well, we're treated like animals all the time and nobody's here to save us. 
but you want us to think about the animals as well. And I think you have to come to um, veganism as an active listener. If somebody's telling you, I'm thinking about going vegan, but I'm thinking about my health. And then you automatically go into, well, you know what they do with the animals? You should see what they do with the animals. Like you just lost that audience right there. And it happens a lot. So yeah. if it's going to be, you're going to speak to a black person about the, the, the possibility of going vegan, you have to appeal to what their want is and what their why is. And that's anybody across the board. But since we are talking about the black community, you can't, you can't overstep what they're telling you they want to go vegan for. If they want to go vegan, you got to kind of, mm. kind of nudge them along the way and be more of a, a helpful hand instead of a powerful fist. I love that. So one, one of the things I noticed about the book in terms of the foods you talk about and the gorgeous you know, recipes is like at, at some point I got in my head a very, I think it's a useful concept around cultural sensitivity, um, right? Like when you're trying to introduce a cuisine to a community, right? You're sort of sensitive to what they're used to and what they like. And somehow in my head that translated in a, in a really weird way that I'm kind of ashamed of, like, like this kind of elitism, like, oh, well, quinoa is for white people. <laughs> and and really, like when I'm looking at your book, it's like, why would I think, you know, I, I'm, you know, Ashkenazi Jewish from Russia and Poland. Like quinoa is no more part of my culture than it is of like, you know, West African culture or Southern black culture. And yeah. like, I, I love like you're not, you know, it's like it, it kind of educated me that I, I like I sh there's there's like I'm talking down to people in a way saying, well, you know, there's collard greens that are vegan, you know, and it's in sweet potatoes as opposed to yeah. like sushi and sashimi and, and like everything that you're presenting. Yeah. So it was really helpful for me. Thank you. Man. I appreciate that. You know, I, I just find that sometimes mm -hmm. we um, we're dealing, like you said, like uh, individuals of color, sometimes uh white people want to relate so bad to them that they try to like make themselves cooler. But in a sense, they're like, literally, like you said, they're talking down. It's like, no, no, just talk to me like you would anybody else, but understand the differences between, you know, I might have been raised this way, but if you talk to me in a certain way that you would talk to anybody else with respect, I'm going to understand it the same way. <laughs> Love that. Love that. So um, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about the book because I want everyone to go and get it. When when is it coming out? Uh, March fourteenth. Got a copy here. Like this is the only advanced copy that I had. So, but uh, March fourteenth is uh, coming out. It's uh, available for pre order now, and um, very excited to see how it does on the on the market. Awesome, awesome. I hope I hope um, you know. All, all the people that you mentioned in the acknowledgments are, you know, Robert Cheek, Rich Roll, folks like that are going to go hard to uh, to make it a, a, a bestseller because it, it, it needs to be and the world needs it. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, when you started writing, um, there's, you know, there's there's parts of it that, that make me think like you're writing to a black audience and parts of it that seem, you know, sort of you know, un universal, as you sat down to write the book, what, who are you writing for? What did you want the book to do in the world? I, I wanted it to be, you know, being a, being a person of uh, African-American descent, native descent as well. Um, I wanted it to be for people of color, brown, black, BIPOC. But I also understand that, you know, while I, I do know that this system has not been in favor of the BIPOC community, I do also understand that if you're not a part of the one percent, this rich elite, um, you're you're a, you're basically collateral damage. Like that one percent doesn't care if you're white <laughs> and you eat the wrong things as well. So it's for that's why you feel like uh. for sometimes talking to a particular culture or a particular race, but then for the most part, you're gonna feel like I'm talking to everybody, and that's where the concept came from. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that's such an important concept for like when you look historically at the ways, you know, the non one percent have been divided 
Yeah. Oh yeah. They do a great against job. Against each other as sort of a. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's also something like, as I was reading your recipes, you know, you've got like, you know, this very salty language, um, you know, a lot of um, liberal, liberal cursing. And it reminded me of, um, you know, Thug Kitchen, which, mm -hmm. which was a cookbook that came out, I guess, seven, seven or eight years ago that did all the same things. And then we yeah. discovered it was like two young upper class white people who had, you know, appropriated it. And, you know, apparently the recipes are great. Like I know people who just like, okay, this is like really good food, but there's, there's something also about like the way America consumes black culture mm -hmm. that like, this is going to be a cooler book than anything I could write. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the crazy part was that when, uh, when Thug Kitchen first came out, a lot of people thought it was me. Um, so people would always write me, man, I love what you do with that Thug Kitchen thing. I'm like, actually, that's not me. And and, and to, to a little bit to their credit, I guess you could say, I knew they weren't black when I first read the first like recipe. I was like, no black person curses like this. Like, this is definitely not. <laughs> um, which I actually, you so know, this, is, this is how white people think like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how white people think black people curse. This is not how they curse. And I, you know, I'm, and I, I'm actually cool with them to this day. I've, I've actually had conversations with them. And we talked about, you know, hey, you know, the fact that you used the kitchen, that name probably wasn't the best idea. And they came to grips with it. You know, they, they finally changed their name and things like that. But I think I think if they would have called it anything else but the kitchen. It, it probably would have went over a lot better. Um, but, yeah, like that. It's funny. Like so many people thought it was me. I was like. Now, I was like, I wish I would have came up with that idea, but that wasn't me because yeah. literally that's the way I've talked since I've opened up my first social media account. I've, I've never like held any punches. I've never sugarcoated anything. And I, and I believe honestly that the right curse word can just make a sentence pop that much better. And why not a recipe? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. My dad always taught me it was like, you know, condiments, like seasoning. Exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. you can say, yo, this is the best he was, burger he I've was ever in the had. Army. Yeah. You can say this is the best burger I've ever had. Or you can say this is the best fucking burger I've ever had. It just separates the two all the way. <laughs> Beautiful. So, um, one of the things I love is how carefully you've thought out what trend, what a transition, what a successful transition looks like. And, you know, you, you call out something that I've seen so many cookbooks and health books do that I, I guess it drove me crazy, but I never understood why it's like, here's 30 days of, re of, of recipe of meal plan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, someone, someone you know, gets serious. They're going to go out and they're going to spend hundreds of dollars trying to do all this new stuff they've never done before. And it's going to be overwhelming. And you're like, just yeah. eat the same thing every day for a month. Yeah. Like my thing, my thing is that you got to have fun. Like you got to enjoy the process. If you don't enjoy the process, like if you notice in the book, I relate it literally to a new relationship. You get in a new relationship. You're gonna be doing it everywhere. You're gonna have you, you're gonna be in the airplane, or you're gonna be in the library, you're gonna be in the dressing room, at home in the middle of the day. It's a new relationship and you're trying to learn each other. You're trying to learn the ins and outs, what what makes you happy, what doesn't make you happy. Do the same thing with this food. You find out what you like and what you don't like. And then at the end of that 30 days, once you're in, now, if you have a goal, if you have a goal, if you want to lose weight, you want to gain weight, you want to maintain, you want to lose, you eat less of what you like. You want to gain, you eat more of what you like. And if you just want to maintain, just keep doing what you've been doing for the last 30 days. And it kind of takes away that whole, like, oh, man, I have to read a whole new instruction manual to life now. You kind of get rid of that and you uh -huh. just enjoy the process. I, you know, I love that metaphor because... You know, yeah, like I could, I could feel like, like, oh yeah, that first flush of love when you're just infatuated, and you know, 
all all inhibitions are gone like you know yeah. public display dif displays of affection like oh look at me eating this plant-based burger this is amazing <laughs> <laughs> right. right but then also like we understand like the first you know flush of a new relationship is different from the li the lifetime of that relationship where you mm -hmm. You know, you do do some hard work. You do. It does get, you know, it can get challenging and allow you some like like deeper growth. But like I, I like like let's just let's let's start with that fuel in the tank of just like this is fun. It's not I have to give it up because my doctor said or because I'm a bad person if I don't. Right. And then it, and then once you fuel it with your why of why you went vegan, like, like, like we talked about in the beginning of the conversation, whether it's for the animals, for the ecosystem, for human rights, for your own health, whatever it is, that's going to be the reason why you stick to this relationship and make it work. Because if you're doing it for health, then why put your health off? Um, if you're doing it for animal rights, then why would you put, you know, the animals lives at risk? Cause you just wanted that burger. If you, doing it for the ecosystem, then you know, like, contributing this is going to affect the ecosystem. And if you're doing it for human rights, you know that if you buy this bacon, it's contributing to the CAFOs that are polluting the people that surround it. So as long as you go for that 30 days and understand it, when you get to that situation where you're at your uncle's house and it's the barbecue happening and the smell hits your nose and all these memories come back, you're like, you know what? I got this great relationship over here that I've been working on for so long and me and my new boo, we're happy over here. And you, you, you stick with that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. About your ex. Um, <laughs> say, say again. I say you forget about your ex. You forget about your, uh huh. Yeah. That's, you know, I first heard that from, you know, Josh Lajani when he told me, you know, he talked about like his, you know, growing up in Louisiana, Cajun culture and all the great food there. He's like, yeah, you know, it's still, it's still, you know, like my ex is still beautiful, but I don't want to date her anymore. Yeah. You yeah. know, I've, I She's moved toxic. on. We broke up. <laughs> She's toxic. Yeah. I can't. Toxic. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, um, what, tell us the name of the book, just so people have it in their minds. The name of the book is Badass Vegan. Um, subtitle, you know, fuel your body, fuck the system and live your life right. So pretty much self-explanatory. I break it down, like, just like my process, but also like, you know, giving more of a, a definition of what veganism is, how you can be vegan. Uh, again, learning your why, and, and while it does have recipes in it, it's not necessarily a cookbook, more like what you said, a health book um, and how to get there. But we also give you 80 recipes to fall back on to help with that transition. Right. And I, so now I know how to pronounce P-H asterisk C-K. It, it is, in fact, fuck, as in no, fuck it's the fun. system. It, um, it took a long time to get that on the book. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, like one, one of the things about that, like we've seen, you know, in the last six years, um, since the rise of Trumpism and since, you know, COVID and COVID denialism and QAnon, that there's, um, like in our community, you know, in the vegan community in particular, um, there is like, like you say in the book, like there's a very healthy reason for vegans to not trust the medical system. Oh yeah. Definitely. Right. Cause like, you know, most doctors wouldn't, wouldn't say what that doctor told you that this is, you know, this is reversible. It's lifestyle. And yet at the same time, you know, we were like, fuck the system. We've seen all these overreaches and people starting out like vegan, like, okay, well, doctors don't know everything about food and moving into like conspiracy theories and, you know, right. racist, anti-Semitic rhetoric. And like, what, how do you think about, you know, knowing that we don't know everything and we probably don't know much in terms of like what's real and what's, be, what, what's being fed to us as propaganda. How, how do you personally um, sort of maintain 
a truth filter so that you're saying like, I reject a lot of the mainstream, but I don't, yeah. you know, I don't reject I, all of it or, you know I think, what I'm I think, the best, I think the best thing that's helped me out is that I can live my truth and not knock anybody for living theirs. And I think one of the biggest things is that, you know, of course there's, there's some boundaries that I just don't, uh, I don't fuck around with. Um, one of the greatest memes I saw during during the pandemic was it was these it was a cartoon of two two friends sitting eating pizza, and the white friend is like, um, "Yeah, we can disagree on things and still be friends," and then the black girl is like, "Yeah, we can disagree on things, but if you're fucking racist, it's not pizza." And it's like you know what I'm saying it's like, "Yeah, we can disagree on like what toppings go on top of the pizza." But we can't disagree on what the fuck racism is, you know. Um, so there's yeah. there's things like that. There's like, like uh, there's some people that believe in the vaccine, some people that don't believe in the vaccine. I believe no matter which way you take it, you don't have to hate the other person either because they feel the other way. And that I think that's what's always helped me. Like I said, I believe in my truth, and I don't knock anybody else for believing in their truth as long as they're not hateful in their truth. There's there's a there's a way mm -hmm. to live your truth without hating somebody else, and as long as I don't, as long as I'm true in mind and spread love, then my heart is happy. I'm stress free with it. I think a lot of times, and a lot of times, what I've noticed on, especially online, and you probably seen this too, is that the people that are so hateful online, they have demons in real life that they're scared to deal with. So they think online that they can come mm -hmm. on and be hateful. And, and just spew all this like nasty rhetoric and all these things because they don't have to deal with us after they log off. And the person or entity or job or whatever it is that they're really mad at, they're scared to go back at them. And that's usually the case. Right. It reminds me, I think it's a James Baldwin quote about saying like, if, if, if white America didn't have black America to hate, they'd have to deal with their own problems. Right. Yeah, I heard that one. Okay. So uh, can we talk about your your movie? Because I've, I've heard little things about it. First of all, the, you know, the title itself is like really, um, you know, energizing. And then the folks who are involved from Keegan Kuhn, who did, you know, Cowspiracy and a bunch of others. What the hell? And yeah. uh, Billie Eilish is what the hell? And Billie Eilish is involved. Mm -hmm. Uh so yeah, so well, they're how, trying how, to kill how did us that here. come how did that come about? Um the uh, Billy part? No, the whole thing from from you from oh, your, the whole your initial conception. Like. So I had I've I've always dealt with film. Uh it was minor editing my own stuff. I edited a couple clients things here and there. And Keegan and I have been friends for quite some time. And he had um I actually reached out to him. I was like, hey, man, I got this idea of reaching more people of color uh, than, than normal. And he was like, all right, so what are you thinking? And I kind of broke down the, the synopsis of the film. And I said, but I think we need to use hip hop because hip hop is the most influential genre that we've ever seen. Um, people follow hip hop for where they travel to, the clothes they wear. Shoot, people even date a certain type of person because that person's dating that type of person. They do everything that these stars do, but they don't really pay attention to what they eat. So it's like, well, why don't we show, like, there are people out there that are in this plant-based vegan movement and show why they transitioned. Why did they think it was bullshit to keep eating this meat? Why did they think it was, like, um, just detrimental to their health and their community's health by doing it? And that's when it came about and we started laying the groundwork and it just kept going. And at, at this point, we're still working on distribution. Um, like I said, just had a talk with uh, BBC earlier today, right before this call. Um, so we're, we're still working on distribution. And believe me, I get it's so funny. I get a combination of hate mail and admiration at the same time, which is so funny. Um, like I'll get somebody saying this film is too amazing. Why haven't you fucking let it out? You're dropping the ball. You fucking loser. I'm like, well, you just told me the film was amazing. And then you called me a loser at the same time. I'm like, hey, look, 
if you own Netflix, you let me know, and then we'll put it right on there. So we can eliminate that right there. Uh, uh huh. Are you are you are you coming up with resistance around how how deeply you're implicating the system? Like you're not saying, like like they're trying to kill us isn't you know a sort of neutral statement about well the system evolved in certain ways you're you're like and in the book you're like look the head of um you know mcdonald's was on the far was in pharmaceutical and like yeah. like it's not hard to see the conspiracy when you're willing to open your eyes and look at it yeah no you know we did it we did fall into some resistance uh one major network that we actually talked to um i never forget we were talking to the president of the network and they told us how amazing the film was. They said it was the best documentary they've ever seen. And it was so integral in helping heal the black community. And they went into it. They said their lawyers fact checked everything, everything checked out. But then they said, you know, but we do have to like, um, we need to cut it down by like 30 minutes. And we're like, well, I mean, it is a little long, but if you say so, that's fine. And without us even asking, the president went on to say, yeah, because the film goes directly after our main advertisers. And me and Keegan are on the Zoom call and we look at each other like, wow. Like you just said how amazing the documentary was, how it was gonna help heal the black community, but then you're also worried about your advertiser. And this is like one of the richest networks out there. So it was very interesting to see uh -huh. and it just let us know we were on the right path too. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's been a you know, commonality for Keegan's movies is is like realizing that there are real like, you know, oh, well, he's being a conspiracy theorist. He's being, um, you know, um, yeah. he's just, you know, being sensationalist about what's going yeah. on. And then you realize, <laughs> yeah, you realize that, no, actually, there are understandable forces that want to keep this secret. Of course. Yeah. Or at least. Uh, or at least don't want to dirty their hands with it. Right. That's that's the main thing. They don't want to dirty their hands. They don't want to they don't want to mess up their income or they don't want to be a part of that movement, they say. Right. Um so yeah, so I am interested in the you know, the Billie Eilish angle. Um I have I have two two kids who are homeschooled who are also both musicians, so they're very interested in like what she and her brother did, and <laughs> how, how did how did that come about? Well, actually, I'm uh, I'm good friends with Maggie, uh, their mother, and so okay. uh, through conversation, um, when Maggie found out I was doing the film, she was like, "Oh my God, I'm so proud of you! It's the way to go." And then later on down the line, she goes, "Hey, do you all have an executive producer yet?" I'm like, "Well, we're working on one, which was Chris Paul at the time." And I said, but yeah, we don't have anything like just like one main one. She goes, well, what if we had Billy come on as like a producer to help like just promote the film? Like she didn't want any money for mm. it. She didn't want anything for it. She just wanted to help promote and use her voice. And I'm like, well, I'd be an idiot to say no. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, she's one of the most influential people out there. So I'm like, yes, of course, that'd be great. And then that's when I hit her with the question. I said, would Billy want to be interviewed for the film? And she was like, well, let me check with her. And Billy was like, of course. And so we set it up and we interviewed Billy for the film. And it just, I mean, it was, it was great to have her there to, like you said, you know, use that voice of privilege to break down. Like, yes, this system is corrupt. And if you open your eyes, you can see it. <laughs> Right. So I'm, I'm curious about something there because, um, you know, just generationally. So it sounds like you're, you're in your 40s. So you, you know, were born yeah. somewhere in the like 80, early 80s, late 70s, something like that. Yeah. Like so. um, I was born. I was born in 65. Do you, when you look at younger people, sort of Gen Z's, do you see sort of more openness and hope and fluidity and, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. Like, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was like, you know, it's so crazy. When I was 18, I didn't give a damn about politics. I didn't care about the movements. I didn't care about, you know, any of the stuff that these 18-year-olds care about today. Like, I really think we're in good hands because, I mean, not only just the political aspect, they're more in touch with spirituality. They're more in touch with, you know, um, 
anti-bullying, you know, like stuff that we just used to let slide because we were like, oh, man, you got to be tough. You got to deal with this. <laughs> like, no, they're like, no, that's bullshit. You shouldn't have to deal with that. That wasn't right when they did it back then. It's not right now. And, you know, like, I, I think I think it's so dope to see that they are encompassing that. Are there some stuff that, like, they might get wrong along the way? Of course, everybody does. But I think in general, it's a great uh, – a great movement that they have going as far as like the self positivity, loving yourself, loving your neighbors, you know, the stuff that we lied about and talked about, we wanted to do back in the day, they're actually doing it more. Uh, right. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, so where, where is the film now in terms of, you know, when people are going to be able to see it and share it and make noise about it? Still working on that distribution. Um, once that's done, it should be open. It's just, uh, that's what, you know, partnering with the BBC will do. Uh, give us a, a production mm -hmm. partner to basically take it to a larger scale and then get it out there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm saying we should know more by mid-year. We should know more by mid-year about exactly what direction we're going in. Um, I wish it would have been out a year ago, but you know, timing is everything. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask how, how many hours have you put into it? We basically been filming for five years. So I was just talking to somebody yesterday and they were saying that, you know, I'm most likely eligible for like an honorary doctorate because the amount of hours that I put in <laughs> over five years that I put in, and they were like, if it's okay with you, I'd like to nominate you for it. I'm like, please, like, um, yeah, let's do it. Like, so, yeah, I would say, man, over that five years, I couldn't, I couldn't even put into words how many hours I think I've done. Wow, and you know, I've, I've, I've witnessed um, other films take a long time. You know, I, like um, the Game Changers. I, I saw the first rushes of that uh 2015 yeah. and it didn't come out until like like four years later yeah. and like what what keeps you going because i can't i'm like you know my big project is i write books and i know they'll take a year or two but they're kind of in my control yeah all, you know all along the way i can't imagine doing something as ambitious as a film and and just having to trust the universe to come through um I would say the biggest thing that keeps me going is like knowing that the message has to get out and that if I was to stop now, yes, yeah, somebody might come along, grab the ball and then, you know, take it to the end zone and deliver that message. But what if they don't, you know, like I, I, I would hate to have that on my shoulders as that message didn't get out just because I gave up and I dropped the ball. So mm. yeah, what keeps me going is that, I know how many lives that this, this documentary can save and how many lives it can influence. And so it's up to me to, and Keegan to just keep going no matter what. Love it. Love it. So you, uh, you talk about your kids a lot and your social media yeah, um, and what, you know, what they mean to you and your relationship. What's, yeah. you know, and on your best days, like what's, what's your vision for your kids future you know in, in 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 america and in the world like what what you know you said it's gonna you know 400 more years but what do you see in their <laughs> lifetime in terms of you know your your most optimistic view? just not deal, not dealing with the you know the atmosphere of hate that can be surrounded um you know not only with just in your own community but the hate that can be involved with misunderstanding. I think it's so interesting to me that in today's culture, you can have a situation where you could talk about a bad situation you went through and somebody can hate you for the bad situation you went through. Instead of understanding, they, they're like, well, you didn't go through this because I didn't go through this. It's not that way. It's, you know, I would love for them to be able to live in a, in a, in a world that understands that Everything doesn't always go our way. And if you have to deal with it, that doesn't make you a bad person. And if you express what you had to go through, that doesn't make you a bad person. 
And I just want to be just surrounded by, mm. by love, surrounded with love, which I, I, I wholeheartedly break my, my back to do for them. Um, because I know also that like, I wasn't raised with a father. I didn't meet my father until I was 21. So like, you know, just like I was working out the other day and they were like in the garage with me while I was working out. And for me, that was the world of difference right there. But a lot of people that haven't come from my background don't understand how significant that is. So they don't see that one little minor thing is, you know, changing generational trauma that we talk about. Um, and just being in their lives and being a positive, you know, role model and enforcing that in their lives. So I hope, you know, my hope is that they don't have to deal with the bullshit that I had to deal with growing up. Amen. Amen. John Lewis, it's been so much fun getting to know you a little bit. I'm so happy that you you guys reached out and I got to read the book and I got to, to meet you and sort of ba bask in, in the glow of your love and positivity. So I wish you all, you know, all the best with the book, with the movie. Um, and uh, hope someday I'll, I'll, I'll head down to the to the beach and we can maybe do a do a run together on the, the Wilmington Let's beach. do it. Let's do it. And I appreciate the invite, brother. I really do. We got we got to tell Josh to come on. All right. With the run. Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to get him, uh, get get a a full conversation going with the, with both of you. That'd be fun. We'll go to the bayou. That way, we all just be there. <laughs> all right, <laughs> we could we could do that. There's, there's uh, lots of interesting things going on there. Lots. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> Great to meet you. Thank you again for everything you do and for taking the time today. Thank you, brother. You have a good one. And thank you, everybody, for listening. All right. Take care. All right. Peace. Okay.